Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome back to another Real Conversation, a wild and exciting one. We don't know if it will be. We'll, we'll try our best with Danielle DiMartino Booth, who's head of, well, founder of C CEO, everything. Quill everything. Intelligence yeah, now. I get You're, to do the dishes, too. Quill you, Intelligence. You, you do that, all do. that. That's do awesome. Do cool. That's a cool name. How'd you, well, how'd you think about it? Quill Intelligence. I am a master writer, and I like to get deep down into the intel, so I just married the two. Nice, nice. I was inspired one day. I literally saw Quill, and I'm like, that's it, Quill Intelligence. That's awesome. So you do um, you do a weekly with Quill that you get amped up about? I We do a weekly that's kind of a deep dive institutional called the Weekly Quill, and then yep. we do something that has got a cult following on the street called the Daily Feather. Yeah. So that's quick, 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 quick. Yeah. And then oh, the, the Weekly is like big, yeah. big, big, big picture. Yeah, you, she kind of has a cult following, by the way. Some of you are, are part of her <laughs> cult, and now I'm in your cult, so thanks for making it. I think some people wanted to, like, and we do have to quote unquote preview what we think is going to happen at the meeting, but uh, to your point right before we went live, it's all about what happens post. Oh, and, yeah. and a lot about you know running money is certainly setting up for the post. Right. So, so maybe like you know talk about how you see this yeah, playing I mean, out. Okay, so there's going to be a quarter point rate cut. Yay. Um, you know, know there are no surprises, anything like we, that? We know that's happening. Um, I think Powell's dream would be for it to be two and out. Yep. And I think that if he tries to indicate that in the press conference, I think he'll be testing markets. Two in total and out. Two in total. Oh. October is only priced for 40%. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, you think he'd like that? Oh, I think he wants out of the cutting cycle. I don't think he wants to get dragged into the negative interest rate debate. I don't think he wants to f follow Mario Draghi down the rabbit hole. Wow. Um, I don't. Yeah. I, th I think he liked it when rates backed up last week. Mm-hmm. Um, I, he's a bond vigilante at heart. And liked it when the stock market went up, probably likes it that there's progress in the China trade negotiations. All, the stocks are at all time highs. I mean, on the face of it, he's got every reason to be hawkish at the press conference. Yep. He really does. Except for this little thing called, you know, the, the, the attack on the Saudi refineries, GM striking for the first time since 2007. What happened that year? Yep. Oh, I don't know, the repo market completely seizing up and them having to come in and rescue it today and having something of a failed attempt. So, yeah, aside from those things. <laughs> Just a couple things going on. <laughs> how was the play, Mrs. Ford? Yeah. So, but, but I think that he would prefer to lean on all of the green shoots, so to speak. Yeah, so you don't think that, like, and, and we don't want to go down this rabbit hole in, in gruesome detail on the repo market and what just happened, but a lot of people are mm -hmm. asking about it today because it happened. It um, happened. What, what, like, being a Fed insider and, and having and been there. And lo and behold, it didn't, it didn't even take care. The Band-Aid didn't even last long. You've already got the market beginning a mini revolt again. Mm -hmm. Look, we, we have, we know about window dressing. We know about banks trying to push down um, their their reserves at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, at the end of the year it becomes most acute. We know about window yep. dressing. We know that they want to do this. So there's always going to be this pressure building. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, you've got a lot of other factors. You've got foreign central banks that are parking reserves at the Fed yep. because the reverse uh, repo rate pays more. The RRP rate is higher than what they can get just by sitting on T-bills. And there's a collateral issue. Basel III has got unintended consequences because banks can't hold what they mm -hmm. used to hold, which that, that can take you all, you know, off on a completely different d discussion about bond, ETF, liquidity, mm -hmm. et cetera. But there's, there's a lot more going on here than just quarter end and year end. I think it has to do with cycle end mm. and the market trying to figure out what the limits of liquidity truly are. Mm -hmm. And it's all about the liquidity. Yeah. You well, have late to cycle keep the liquidity, liquidity is basically where you've been on this. And this is um, like, yep. I, I don't hang my hat on making a big recession call because I don't need to to make mm -hmm. a lot of money on the long side of treasuries sure. or gold and the short side of stocks. You know what I mean? It's right. like, you just have to be right on the late cycleness of it all. You right. actually put up, and, and what I'm going to do, by the way, for those of you that are following Danielle along, her tweets are, are wicked good. Um, and the first one actually has to do with this, which is, what do the corporates, what do the CEOs think about late cycleness? Oh, yeah. And you had this great like leading question, she said. She said, leading questions, what do C-suite executives um, say when, you know, you know, when, when late cycles followed by wage inflation? By the way, nobody got the answer right. It, nobody? Not, not yet. That's like this guy, like one of these permeable third tier broker guys yesterday, this guy Dwyer, he says, nobody called one and a half percent on the 10 year yield where, you know, it's, it's like bullshit. Oh, for God's sake, that was, mean, that was our first call at the beginning of the year was that the, the 10 year was gonna close out the year south of 2%, that, that the dollar was gonna get stronger and that Germany was gonna go into recession and people are like, she's bat, you know what, crazy. Yeah. 
Well, it's good to be crazy. It's good, you know, you don't look crazy. Uh, C-suite, but, 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 but who what got it? it? Who didn't, have, what do you mean people? That, this is actually, you use the, my old employer, the Carlisle Group as your source, who is not incentivized to tell people about late cycleness, by the way. No, <laughs> nobody's incentivized. Right. Everybody has to hang on. The consumer's doing just fine. That's great, but credit card spending's also going through the roof, which is a whole different story. Yep. Which explains, by the way, July's retail sales strength after the fact. Mm -hmm. I wish the Fed would come out with real-time consumer credit data, but oh well. Um, but if I'm in the C-suite and my chief concern is that I'm in the late cycle mm -hmm. and my second concern is wage inflation, yep. you know you have to cut costs. You know your labor costs are too high. All you have to do is marry the two and say, layoffs. Yep. We're just going to trim headcount. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple as that. And we've definitely seen a progression. I don't think that this is anything necessary. I, I think CEOs and CFOs know what's coming. We had massive benchmark revisions to non-farm payrolls. You know, the way the Bureau of Labor Stati Statistics puts it, you can have a plus or minus 1% um, revision and it's a non-event. Yep. We had a negative 0.4 revision to private non-farm payrolls. Mm -hmm. 514,000 jobs were like, whoops, we miscounted. Sorry. <laughs> they never miscount the other way. No, uh, but for 40 some, some odd thousand every single month. And we've had five back to back revisions to non farm payrolls. To the downside. Yep. To the downside. Real time revisions. Yep. The first thing they taught me at the Fed was monetary policy works with a lag of nine to 24 months. Mm -hmm. The second thing they taught me at the Fed was if you're looking for an inflection point in an economic cycle, look for three revisions to non-farm payrolls one way or the other. Mm -hmm. You're coming out of recession, you're going into recession if you get three. If you get four, that's kind of a fact. If you but get three in a row would be just what I would call a trend. I always call it three months or more. That's Three months or more, is a, it's a trend, trend of downward revision. So you're, that, that's it. That's, looked at as an inflection point in the economic cycle. Yep. You get to four, it's a fact. You get to five, that's the fact, Jack. Yeah. And CEOs know this. Mm -hmm. They know it, they're seeing it, and the only person who is not seeing it, because by the way, he gave a speech in Zurich the day non-farm payrolls came out, and he knew that there were 17 months in a row of downward revisions, and he just got up to the podium and said, we have a very strong labor market. Mm -hmm. I'm like, God love you, Jay Powell. Ooh, Powell said that. Yeah. See, now, Janet has like not, that 19 indicator labor market model that she uses. She wouldn't have missed that. Yeah, but she threw that away. You forget that. <laughs> I, was, I was there when she threw the baby out with the bathwater because it turned against her. And so she therefore said, oh, I was kidding. It's irrelevant. Well, this is actually, maybe I can throw up a slide on this because this is something that people have not, I like to deal in what is the space you're going to have to deal in space. So yep. slide 77, guys, you show pretty simply, we just show on the left side, we show jobless claims, uh, which has only gone down for the last decade. So anybody under the age of 35 on Wall Street just think that this goes down all the time yep. uh, in the face of the opposite of that thing, which is earnings only going up. On the right side, consumer confidence looks just like the stock market. So what could possibly go wrong? One could go up and the other one could go down. Right. And what you notice is that those two lines don't go up slow, or jobless claims don't go up slowly, they go up all at once. They do. And it's been like waiting forever for that. So at this point, like, I basically just make the argument, uh, duh, earnings are negative year over year, that yeah. means that you have to fire people so the jobless claims bit will start to go up. It's not the crazy, it's not a crazy forecast. It's not, and it's pretty simple math to do, but because we had really bad monetary policy throughout the entire recovery. We've had sclerosis in the labor pool and therefore companies have been much more remiss to let go the labor they fought yeah. so hard to get. To get. Yeah. So we're seeing stickiness mm -hmm. in in jobless claims that we wouldn't otherwise. But that happens in that chart, that happens 100% of the time sure. at, the, at the end of the cycle. Right, but this is the longest labor market expansion in U.S. history. Right, but so still, it, actually go it, to the chart before that, guys. There's another one. Daniel, no, this is, it's, uh, actually go to one more before that. One. So we're showing the, the, the relationship that gives you that, which is U6 minus U3. You're the only person I'll talk to on TV that knows what yep. that is. But again, that's the underemployed. That's the deplorables. That's right. off your opioid couch. My brother is a McDonald's franchisee. He has to hire or try to hire these people because there's nobody left. You know, there's not, they're yep. overpaying at this point yep. to, to part of the labor force that's never been paid. Um, so I wonder. And, and they're both off their lows. Yes, but generational lows. Like if you go, go to the second oh, one that you just gosh, showed. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Like labor versus capital. Labor's never 
That's labor against capital going all the way back to, to when you, and by the Forever. way, happy birthday. I was going to say since you were born. Thank you. Yeah. And to Liz Ann Saunders, by the way. Her birthday, same day? Today. The two coolest, yes. the two coolest yes. girls on the One ball. blonde, one brunette. <laughs> they came together in a bar. <laughs> yes, no, it's our birthday. And you guys can actually tolerate me. This well, is yes. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> she says hello, by the way. Oh, cool. But that, but that chart, actually, going back to when we were born, everybody, you know, anybody that was born in the 60s and 70s, you were born in the 80s, of course. But if you look at this, uh, this chart, <laughs> it's never the greatest gray line, which is labor, has never come off these lows. It was always high and rising. Yep. So that's why people like Reagan and Clinton. The people are getting paid and profits is the upside down of that. So I always go back to this and I say, you know, what could possibly go wrong? It's going in the opposite direction of where it should, but it's coming from the most asymmetric point. Right. So now what? Like, yeah. how does the Fed deal with that? What is there a model at the Fed that says jobless claims rising and uh -huh. corporate profit recession equals Let's try to be done with two cuts. Uh, it surely should not equate to a mid-cycle adjustment. <laughs> right. It's like, hello. That's bananas. It's, it's certifiably bananas. It is. It, it really actually is. And it, and it goes against, again, what the Fed teaches you on day one, which means that they're either in denial or trying to put a good public face on this. What part of it, that last part, do you think it, they're trying to put a good public face? Well, I, I think that they know that this is a confidence game. Yeah. Jay Powell understands that he has to keep credit volatility contained. That's a big thing. At all costs. Yes. All costs. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, the day that the, the street knew that the Ford downgrade was coming, but I'm sure he probably has got a nervous tick whenever he, hear, he hears like a big debt, a big debtor in the market is being downgraded after what happened with General Electric. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was only Ford's first downgrade to junk. It was GE's second. Very Anyways. stable industry across U.S. history, of course. Oh, yeah. You know, Standard & Poor's has come out with a new report today that says the global auto industry is going to stay in a slump for the next two years. And GM is striking, and that's okay, too. There, look, there is so much prima facie evidence that the Fed is choosing to not see its frightening. But is that, is that because they're, try, they're choosing to prove that they shouldn't be as dovish as Trump wants them to be? I'm not, I, it's nothing to do with what Trump wants. It's trying to refute. Are they staying too tight to spite the White House? Yeah. Well, I mean, like that we're was, doing our job. He's a lawyer. He's like, I'm proving. That, that was the theory about what happened uh, with the December rate hike. Yeah. Was that they knew that it was a bridge too far and that they crossed it anyways just to say we're independent and we're going to show that yeah. we're not being swayed in any way by politics. Um, that's dangerous when it's your job to shepherd the world's financial system. Mm -hmm. But again, I think that in Powell's mind at least, keeping confidence high right now, keeping the stock market high is priority number one because the stock market has never been as tethered as it is to the real economy. Right. Now people are like, but only 53% of Americans own stocks, it's not that relevant, it's not a big deal. I'm like, it's the bleed through factor. Mm -hmm. It's the first chart. It's what happens in the C-suite. I, mean, I, I, I sent another tweet out a few days ago that was like, what happens if a CEO sees his stock price go down? <laughs> What's the first thing that happens? He, he goes and fires somebody to make himself feel better. Yep. So it, it, um, And people also forget the duration. That the, the average tenure of a CEO in the S&P 500 is inside of five years. He, he's not a long-term investor as, as far as we've been so taught these, these, these the, ridiculous the notions. The least followed gauge that's become my new favorite you know, Challenger Grain Christmas has layoff data every month. And people pay attention. Yep. Thursday before the, the, they don't pay attention anymore because now it's 12 months in a row of year-over-year -year increases. So they're like, that data, the data, forget it. That <laughs> data set doesn't matter. They track CEOs. They track the revolving door of CEO exits. Yep. And it's running at a record high. I believe that. This is publicly traded and private companies. Yeah. Now, okay, here's a third leading question. They all have the same answer. That's the beauty of it. If you need somebody who's going to be agnostic to headcount reduction, what do you do? <laughs> you bring in a fresh blood henchman and you stick him in the C-suite and he doesn't know anybody. He's gonna be like, he's gonna look at the spreadsheet. He's gonna say, well, we've gotta cut this, so cut that. Yeah. But record, the month of August, record, 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 CEO um, turnover. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. And it's, so, it's pro cyclicality at its best. If it wasn't late cycle, n none of these things, first of all, happen. No. And people always go back to 2016 with me and they say, hey, look, 
2016, it's like earmuffs. I mean, 2016 was a, was actually a mid-cycle slowdown. And we had the biggest stimulus in the history of China, which kind of kind of matters. And we had Janet Godovich drop the dots, yeah. dollar down, which allowed the Chinese to stimulate faster and more aggressively. It's not even close to 2016. Nope. Didn't and you have you had this massive tailwind of residential real estate in 2016. Yes, good point. You've had yeah. a hundred basis point decline basically in in um, mortgage rates, and you've not seen near the traction you theoretically should have seen. Yep. Because house prices are too high. Mm -hmm. Mortgage Bankers Association came out with fresh data just a few days ago that shows lending standards for mortgages are tightening in a falling mortgage rate environment. Yeah. I mean, it, none of it makes sense. It's actually been, I mean, I just went through it, so like a non-idiot, I, re I refinanced. Okay, duh. You have a call that interest rates like, Tony, you know, we're going to go to all-time lows here was the view. So my wife and I kind of go with the view yeah. and we refinance. They looked at me like, they looked at my personal, like, I'm not going to name names, you know, to, to the investment yeah. bank that I flipped to to go to the better rate, because they're giving you ridiculous, if you put this amount of capital into your new account, we're going to give you this teaser rate, your interest rate for six months, oh, yeah. which is a money losing thing there. I was like, this is all cool, until they actually started to go through the review. Per my file had to get reviewed by a new group. Uh -huh. My. Because they have this thing that basically says, well, we have to look at the LLC's profitability. I mean, are you kidding me? Hey. I mean, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The amount of money I just put in, like, th th there is a high bar to get your, is my point. I'm not trying to huh? big time anybody here and say, hey, look, you know, it's, it's just that you can't just go refinance. No. There is an extremely high bar, and there's a long duration to get what you think you, you were going to get. And yet refinancing applications are up, what, like 170% year over are, year? But apps are apps, up. The, apps are up. The difference yep. between apps yep. and the new, the new disclosures you have to provide are, I, I, would, I, I was dumbfounded by this. Believe it or not, the realtors have a lobby in Washington. So <laughs> really? it's, re it's really hard to <laughs> get your more. hands on the fail rate of... <laughs> Mortgage bankers will tell you all day long that applications are up. They will not tell you, yeah. you know, how, what the percentage of them is that fail. If anybody right. has that information, please send. Yeah. So, because that's that's the differentiating, even for purchase applications. Yep. Well, mortgage purchase applications, that's been one of the more bullish charts because it couldn't have been more bearish when rates right. were rising. Sure. But, I mean, that's, everybody kind of got that one. But again, I mean, I, I, I graphed it out a few weeks ago. Even that is not showing as much traction as it should it, yeah. from the decline in mortgage rates. Yeah, well, I mean, so how does the, you know, what would, I guess it doesn't matter what the old Fed would do. I mean, what does this Fed do when he's trying to go from only two and I'm good, I'm done, to 50 basis points at a time, buddy, because high yield spreads are widening 50 basis points a week and corporate profits are negative. Like, what yep. does that world look like? Do you think that he'll look like he's panicked? I always say poopy poopy in the pal pants. I mean, like, come on, buddy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and on top of the that fact visual. that, like, our friends here at Carlisle Group, which I used to work for, which I don't have to apologize for either, good guys. All, everybody's a good guy, especially if Powell gets paid 105 million bucks. Uh -huh. I mean, they, they were aggressively contacting him, private equity was, in December. So how does that play out? How do you think it plays out? Let's just say... Well, private equity cannot afford for the junk bond market to shut down, right. for so heaven's how, sake. How I'm fully expecting Powell like, to, to go, not dovish enough tomorrow, but have a scary Halloween at the next meeting. Like, do you no. think he could go 50 basis points? Do you think that that's where he's going to go at a time, but he needs the market to scare him or not? I, I think, yes. I think you need a market scare to trigger anything of that sort because he won't even go as far as he needs to go to uninvert the yield curve. Right. So he's clearly not incentivized by what the markets are telling him in, in, in a state of calmness. Mm. I think there has to be disruption to get his attention because it was disruption that, that prompted him to say, I take it back, I love QE. Yeah. Bear hug. So, but, the, but it took disruption. <laughs> <laughs> and what does it take these other people? There's another great tweet by, I don't know if this is yours or not, but, but Danielle oh, yeah. shows the, the spectrum, like the dove hawk From spectrum. Doves to hawks, yeah. And you put this guy that nobody listens to who's had like f f five jobs in 10 years, cash and carry over here. <laughs> and you got Bullard here. My but, old boss, Richard Fisher, called him um, Kardashian oh, on TV. Cash, ca Neil Cash Carry. But uh, Bullard's actually very important. So you have him on the most left point. Now, he seems to be the most trigger happy. I don't know. Do you know him personally? I've, I don't know any of these I people. Have, I can't say that I've met Jim. Okay. Um, I have met a few of these these characters. Um, but he's got impact. Like CNBC dials him. He's like on auto dial. Oh, yeah. You know, when we need to do the emergency uh, state of the whatever. Yeah, I, uh, I think it's very 
feasible that, that Bullard's dovish descent two meetings ago was orchestrated. Mm. It's like, let's, put it, let, let's show that there's dissension on the FOMC. Because back then you needed to create it because it, it looked like Powell had everybody in constant kumbaya. Ah, that's interesting. Now it's like got to have the spectrum. Now it's a mess. Now it's like <laughs> clearly nobody agrees with anybody. It's like recess. We can't bring the kids in back from, from the from the playground. It's a mess. But it's a mess because these the people are spread people out. Okay. Roll off ah, voting yeah. rotation as of the December meeting. So in 2020, there's a lot more dovish voting yeah. committee. So anybody um, uh, Trump appoints replaces these hawks, and there you go. But d does somebody like Bullard want to be the head of the Fed? He was asked. He Really? Well, he was offered a position on the board. Oh, on the board. Okay. Which is oftentimes a, a stepping stone. Yeah. And that was why he said, no, thank you. But And so Trump said, okay, well, who's who's got his ear? And they said, maybe his director of research. <laughs> so then Trump nominated him. That's hilarious. He, that's he's one of the two nominees, in, yeah. in addition to Judy Shelton, is Bullard's former, yeah, well, current director of research. Oh, by the way, we got questions on Judy Shelton. We have questions on MMT. We're going to go there. But first, before we get off this topic, I want to go to my buddy here, Rosengren. Um, so Rosengren, like, I'll, I'll do my Boston meetings with clients, yeah. and you walk by his office, like, every time you go between, basically, Fidelity mm -hmm. and, and Wellington. And... <laughs> <laughs> the odds of him uh, dissenting are high again. Like, oh yeah, they are. Why wouldn't he do it? I, I think that, that given his tone going into the meeting, it's it's highly feasible that there's another double dissent. Double dissent, right? Because he was one of the two. Yeah. Okay. I think I think. Could I you think have a triple? Because if you dissented on the Trump trade or on the on the tariff uh, scare, and that's actually when they when they were panicking. I mean, these are kind of PhD bean counters here you're talking about, right? Yeah. So they pay attention to things like a benchmark revision of 514,000 because they're buddy buddies with the BLS yeah. and the BEA and, and all, they're, they all hang together in DC. So yeah. you're starting to refute actual data if you're on yeah. the Fed. <laughs> Today I just sent out a note, I put it the header, 31 month low. You just got to put something bigger and worse than what it was. Yeah. The industrial production number today was a 31 month low. The lowest, i.e. the lowest level of rate of change of growth in 31 months, mm -hmm. which for any bean counter, that's a pretty low number. Yep. Or China's industrial production number was a 17 year low. Not 17 months, 17 year Years. low. And we go back to back like that and people are going, why are REITs rallying again? They're so expensive. <laughs> it's, just, it's because people are actually seeing the data. Yeah. So we've kind of gone from that Wally world of trade war on off Mr. Miyagi thing mm -hmm. to, oh, the data. And the month over month, Industrial production number was looked great. Yeah, to, to an idiot, but I mean. But it was a you know it was all driven by this blip in manufacturing. Right. If you net autos out, yeah. manufacturing is down year over year. Yeah, yeah so, negative point so four. So wrap your right. head around the the secular slowdown in the auto industry and inventories that are spiking. GM and Ford choking on trucks. Yeah. Marry that some way somehow to autos holding up industrial production in America. That ain't, it well, doesn't have staying power. Well, that's another tweet that you had. So I got, I got all of our tweets, you know, I pay, I, I pay a lot of attention to them. Um, UAW threatens GM with first strikes since 07. What happened in 2007 I, I mean, in terms of the cycle? Where you, were we? Seriously, people? <laughs> Look, I, I was very cynical in tweeting out because it, it's, it's bad optics for Mary Barra to come out and say, we've got to push through more production cuts. Uh, but, but over Labor Day weekend, there was a Jeep ad advertising a 2018 brand new Jeep. Dealers have three model years on their lots right now. Yeah, yeah. Detroit has a big problem on their hands of inventory, and the UAW just handed Mary Barra a gift. Beauty. She doesn't have to put the press release out anymore that says, I've got to push through production cuts. They just cut it for her. They just idled the, the very lines that she needed to idle. Mm. She's like, this is awesome. Yeah, but it, 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 on top of that, it's just. I mean, it does kind of cost them, a, you know, a boatload of, of money. But it's also, I mean, it's exactly what happens at, at that stage of that slide that again you show capital against labor guys, where the people say, hey, corporate profits at GM are at their yep. at their cycle highs and pretty close to their all time highs. I want to get paid some of that. It's a pretty basic discussion. They're only allowed to really take GM to the rail every sure. four years. Um, so stuff like that. 
happened in 07 for the same reasons that it's happening today? It certainly did. Right. How much, like, as we go forward into this kind of like wall? I mean, these are weird parallels. Well, they're strange parallels. But they're very consistent. Repo market seizing up, and I'm like, is this 2019 or is this 2008? But you, you can't get, you cannot get to the, even attempting to objectively and apolitically answer the question without saying the words late cycle. You just can't. They don't happen unless you have late cycle. No. If, unless you have late cycle in the U.S. and quad four, which we call global slowdown, the dollar isn't punching new highs. So that's late cycle. It's the late cycle divergence that happens. So there's so many different things. Uh, but that Keith, have, we've decoupled. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, I forgot about that globally synchronized recovery, which we had in Q118 yeah. until we didn't. Mm -hmm. um, that's That was lovely, was it not? So shortages of dollars and shortages of long-term bonds. You've talked about liquidity. Mm -hmm. I think... Can we boil that down for people just a little bit in terms of like how you, you talk about, I mean, another tweet that you had. Look, shortages of long-term bonds. You just keep saying the same things over and over again, but the things that you see. There aren't very many out there. Yes. The float net of what the Fed holds on its balance sheet is tiny, mm. which is why you see violent swings far out on the yield curve. Yes. Because there's just not a lot of the paper that goes around. Like Friday was violent the other way. You know? it, and, it, and it can be. Yeah. Um, but but it, it, for us to be saying as a country, we're going to start to issue 100-year bonds. And I'm like, gee, let me think. Argentina beat us to the chase. <laughs> or, or Austria. Whatever. But the fact that we're doing this at this late stage yeah, is just that's... asinine. Can I say that word? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, I think you could say much worse. Um, so I get that. And, and, and then the other point that I want to hit on is, like, the, the link between how people think about rate cuts, or mm -hmm. beg for them rather, on Wall Street. Yeah. And when you get your first one, that's kind of cool because you were hawkish before that, or you go from hawkish to dovish, and then you get a cut, and that's a little less cool. But yep. you, like you said, hey, I can't believe that there's still a debate, or two sides of the debate, on once you get to three cuts and beyond, that that's, that, that could even remotely be good. Well, and I think Powell knows that too. Well, anybody who studied it should be. Right. But, but can you explain why so, that is? Well, you know, your first rate cut, you're going to have a little bit of a sugar high, and this is great, and we're going to have some <laughs> liquidity parties, and yay! We're up a lot year-to-date, Danielle, in January, and actually look at the year-to-date return from the and monkey it, in my it's Twitter stream. Good. It's like, yeah, it's great. And you've got, I mean, you, you've got China injecting trillions of dollars and getting very little traction out of it, and Crazy Mario relaunching QE. There's all kinds of liquidity events happening, and yet, and yet. But if you get to that third rate cut. The third one is what, yeah, this is interesting. Because there were three in 98. And the Fed was able to pull back. Right. And that is what, uh, by the way, the, the very quiet Federal Open Market Committee. I mean, I, I think Jay Powell has silenced people at the board. Mm. I really do. But that is what the vice chairman was speaking about, Rich Clarida. He was talking, he's been talking about up that 98 event. Mm -hmm. And Powell's been talking up the 98 event. And that, the, the 1998 three and out scenario Was is good. what brought up the idea of this mid-cycle adjustment that really pissed off the markets. Right, because it's a way for uh, Clarita or Clarita uh, and Powell to bridge that it's still good. It's still good. But we had to do it. We're just tweaking a little bit to keep the expansion alive. Right. Just but, a little tweak. So the third cut is, it, it's, it's not as good as it was. We only have 17 months of downward revisions to NFP. There's right. no trend there. Okay. Yeah. So that's Just that. A tweak. That's actually where I get into this last tweet of yours. Before I want to, by the way, uh, lock and load. Uh, not to use somebody else's words in in the appropriate uh -oh. sense. Lock and load with your questions. I want to get into the heat. In yeah. How is there gray area there? Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we digress. But the politics of it all. Yes. Okay. So again, like Danielle, forget the politics. What could possibly go wrong? She shows a line that shows consumer sediment amongst Republicans versus Democrats. I mean, are we looking at two different sets of data? No, and you can drive a Mack truck through it. And, and the same thing, though, from, like, is Richard Clarida or Clarida? Clarida, we should call Like, I just make it more interesting. Well, then his first name should be Ricardo. Okay, <laughs> whatever it is. I mean, whatever you would prefer. Shall I just call you a Republican? Is he? Or is he a Democrat? That's a good question. I mean, he's certainly acting like a Republican. He's acting like a Republican. If, if you're characterizing Powell, Jay Powell is a Republican. Okay, so so let's like not. That was like, like the big Trump news flash. <laughs> Somebody whispered into his ear, "He's a Republican already." <laughs> oh my God, I've got a Republican on the board. I can promote to chair. Yay! That didn't last. Can long. we show this? Like, wouldn't it be great if you could show the Fed dot plots for Democrats and Republicans? Wouldn't that be something? I bet you it's it's not far off. 
If you're trying to characterize rate cuts as yeah. mid-cycle, you are taking a, 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 a you're a, taking a very bullish, optimistic view, yeah. and there is no late cycle, and it's all is well. It's just a little tweak. Yeah. So th <laughs> that's going to change. So at some point yeah. in the next three months, I actually think that the window, and I'm very rarely like hocked up on timing. Mm -hmm. Like to me, it's like you don't go dovish enough. You have earnings season. This is where a lot of the things that we've talked about, from GM to yep. wage pressure, really, you know, the poop hits the fan. To an October 31st non-mid cycle adjustment meeting. To me, I very rarely have a view that has an uh, economic cycle view, which right. I have the most conviction well, in, had, and a catalyst that sets up like we, that. But but you, but you're the thing that throws you over the edge though, is this liquidity thing. Because rate cuts don't even really alleviate what's going on in the overnight lending market. Quantitative easing does. Yes, okay. And man, he does not want to go there. That is that okay. is a slippery slide down the modern monetary theory slope. This is like loaded in, talk about lock and loaded in here. I don't even have to tell you. See how there's no questions you can't No see. questions, it's I black. cannot see. This is not a magical, uh, <laughs> this is not um, some kind of central planning trick. This, I don't have to look to know that there's going to be a significant amount of questions because I've already seen my inbox, which come from the institutional investors, mm -hmm. which was today, throughout the day, hey, isn't this a good reason, the repo market activity, for him to really surprise with 50 basis points, shock and awe, plus QE. That's what they really want because the QE really changes the game in terms of how yeah, an institutional it's investor would. actual liquidity. Yes. It's, it's the opposite of quantitative tightening. It is, which kind of exacerbated the situation in overnight lending to begin with. Okay. The paint drying part. Yeah, the, the paint drying part. Okay, so um, can you walk me from the three, once you go to three cuts and beyond. Then you're and, in recession. Okay, and what happens with the liquidity, tr like, is there any other way for the Fed to get out of it other than to introduce new QE? N no, and I, I, I've said this before, uh, is there double easing in the future? Because there is a way out for the Fed to to try and apply more liquidity than they have in rate cuts. Okay. They can double easing is double a cut easing. and a QE. A cut and a QE. Okay. Because they were they were hiking and doing quantitative tightening yep. in conjunction, so which didn't work out very well. So you don't. You, but you're saying that he doesn't want to do QE. This is like you. QE were, is your the, nose. Look, you went like this. You're like look, I know when you don't like something. Like you don't like the idea of him doing that. So, a I think they should stop at one percent. So. Um, and please don't put death threats out for, on me. But I think they should stop at 1%. I think on the rate? On, the, on, on Fed funds. Yep, okay. So um, that's we 125. Have a, we have a banking system. Any model on the planet, if you were to try and plug a negative interest rate into it, okay. you get the, the Black-Scholes model, for example. Yeah. I've been using this a lot lately. If you plug a negative interest rate, a <laughs> negative reference rate into the Black-Scholes model, you get a, a, you, you, you get a value of infinity. <laughs> So what the Japanese had to do, what the Europeans had to do when they imposed negative interest rates was switch their reference rate to a U.S. domestic rate. Yep. So they borrowed ours so that their models wouldn't break down. Now, what happens if nobody has positive interest rates? What happens to U.S. banking mm. if, if they don't have positive interest rates? Because fractional... Banking is all about setting aside a, a small percentage and lending out the rest, yes. and that grows on its on itself exponentially. Mm -hmm. If you're penalizing banks for lending via negative interest rates, they're not going to lend. Mm. You'll bring this economy to its knees. So I think that Jay Powell understands this dynamic and that we need to have positivity in the Fed funds rate. And furthermore, I think he's afraid of quantitative easing as a Republican, as the known Republican that he is, because who would not agree with the statement? Mo I would say that I would say that 90% of Americans would agree with what I'm about to say. Is it better to bail out Goldman Sachs again, or we the people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know the answer to that. Okay, but QE introduces this dynamic, because QE is technically bailing out the <clears throat> banking system again. Mm -hmm. And you're going to, I mean, it'll be like a Warren Sanders party because <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's an invitation. It's a red carpet for MMT for the Fed to relaunch QE. Mm -hmm. And yet the funding markets are screaming for it. And, and that's why, I mean, if, if I'm Powell, I don't have a gray hair left on my head. I'm snow white at some point. Mm.
I, yeah, that, that sounds like the logical. He's aged in office. Uh, yeah, you can see I mean, it. Yeah. I, I'm not in office and I'm aging. Just just, just time and space. Can't, can't stop it. Yep. All right. I can take, do you mind to go to some questions? Let's go to questions. There are too many questions. They're basically firing off on all cylinders. There's one in here. I want to go right to the um, to the Judy Shelton questions. And don't uh, ask me about Greece again. Just remember that Greece probably has a higher rate than we do, okay? <laughs> well, Invest in the Greece risk free rate. Actually, I'm just going to put, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to take, um, guys and gals don't mind, I'm going to basically uh, put a, a big net on top of that on Judy Shelton as a topic and just let you go on it. So, First of all, some people may not know who that is, so if you don't mind. Um, Judy Shelton is a, uh, she's a very well-respected economist, uh, hard money traditionally. Uh, she has advocated uh, post being uh, nominated to sit on the Fed board for taking the Fed funds rate back down to zero mm -hmm. in order to eliminate interest paid on excess reserves. I happen to know Judy. And I said, there's more than one way to skin that cat, and you do not have to go to the zero bound. And she's actually been very critical of negative interest rates. Yep. You don't have to go to the zero bound because then you are right there at the slippery slope of the debate opening up on negative interest rates. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go there to get rid of IOER. Mm -hmm. You just don't. Figure out another way. I mean, she, Trump wants to hear negative rates. Mm -hmm. But if you were to try and translate for him that that would cause lending in America to shut down and he, him being a debt man, that might upset him. Mm -hmm. But I, he, he I think in her heart she's a very disciplined, sound money person. Her, but she's bullish reason, on gold. I mean, Who isn't right now? Yeah, no, no, but she's not like... But she's, be, she's, she's a gold bug. Try to get Ben Bernanke to be bullish on gold. Okay. I mean, seriously. This is in sharp contrast. Right. True and correct. And she's, she's truly a gold bug, which should tell you that... You know, for her to say that, that monetary policy should be coordinated with the White House, I'm like, Judy, Judy, Judy. <laughs> Judy. No, 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 no. You need a Fed that's more independent. Yeah. I mean, I think the irony of, J of the Jay Powell era is that we've, we haven't seen anybody since Paul Volcker was in office at the Fed push back more against the politicians. And yet, he's the guy being castigated as you know, the Fed's being politicized. He's trying really hard to toe that line and not be political, but nobody ever, you know, you only talk about in whispers that Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen were those political Fed heads in the history of mankind. Yeah. Financing God knows what. Yeah. So where do you think she fits in the future state? Look, the thing about her is, which people need to realize on a kind of a housekeeping level, yeah. is she's been confirmed by the Senate. Yeah already. Yeah. So if you're Joe Q Senator, Jane Q Senator, and you already voted to confirm her to one position for the U.S. government, how do you say, how do you say I, I changed my mind? Right. Unless you're a politician, in which case you can do that because that's your job. Yeah. To change your mind. All I'm saying is she's been confirmed once. Mm -hmm. He actually nominated not one but two nominees that are very confirmable. And I don't think that the public appreciates it. And she would certainly add an element of True dissent. Oh yeah, and it's and she's a she. True dissent. This, this is like Fed. I'm not like this is this is. But she's a she she. Yeah. As opposed to to Yellen, who came in and said, "I will not be called chairwoman." And I'm, I'm like, "Well, define what you are." Yeah. So, um, but but she is, but but she she knows her own mind, and it's been disappointing for me that she has said a few of the things that she's said since being nominated. Nevertheless. Like what? like monetary policy should be coordinated with the White House. Yeah, okay. So this is the, yeah, the MMT link and everything else is potentially there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. But it's, it's, it's really hard. I mean, for me at least, I mean, if you're looking for me, if you're looking to be not disappointed with something that comes out of my mouth over time, you're going to be wildly disappointed. I mean, this is just kind of how it is. Look, you know, my, my buddy Jim Bianco was also um, a, a potential nominee. Okay. He's, he's, the Chicago guy? Yeah. yeah. And he, he's been public about it. Yeah. And, you know, in speaking with him, you know, he knows what I know, and that is that there really is no true intellectual dissent mm -hmm. on the committee. You get so overwhelmed with the stardom of yeah. being part of this group that you're sucked into the group think vacuum in like five seconds. <laughs> And you're like, oh my God, I'm on the Fed. But the real stardom and, is to be the dissenter. Look at Bullard. I mean, he's got stardom. 
because he's on the left side he, of your spectrum. He, well, y yes. He, he is the go-to, like if you're going to bet on the house's horse and you're, you know what the VIG is yeah, and you know who's going to come up first dovish, it's going to be But Charlie Plosser was a dissenter. Tom Honig was a dissenter. My old boss, Richard Fisher, was a dissenter. Yeah. But he's, he's Bullard's a believable dove. Like, he is a dove. I mean, he is a believable dove. And to his point about the inverted yield, yield curve, it's a problem. Yeah, yeah, we get that. I mean, Morgan Stanley adjusted yield curve inverted the three-month tenure inverted in December I'm like people <laughs> which speaks to your three-month time frame by the way yeah it's just so true uh, Danielle is the market bigger than the Fed looks like we have an indiscriminate buyer of assets with unlimited funds hmm is the market bigger than the Fed yep and yep. who's the indiscriminate buyer just just Wall Street you know they'll buy any anything this is true. I mean, they'll, they they oh, will it's true. until they won't. I mean, yeah, yeah. They, they will. Buy, FOMO is is the hashtag on this one. Um, Absolutely. So is the market bigger than the Fed at this point? Is that, is, I think the market um, controls the Fed. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you see some of the garbage leverage loans that have been priced and yes, yes, the market is much bigger than the Fed and the market will control the Fed. Now, how about, um, we're gonna get into this, what's bigger, who's, who's bigger thing. Um, can the Fed outdo the ECB, who's the bigger winner of the currency war? You know, I mean, they're in negative rate territory and you know, we had a, a little bounce in industrial production. We had a little bounce in German confidence. I think, I think the bounce is related to hopes yeah for ECB tiering and QE being resumed. Germany's in recession. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means that the euro should be weaker. Mm -hmm. It has been. And yes, mm -hmm. but that means that it's going to be very difficult given theoretical 25 basis point increments in terms of what the Fed has mm -hmm. to spend. It's gonna be really difficult to fight that currency war. Mm -hmm. And I think that Jay Powell wants to get out of this. Mm -hmm. I don't think he wants for, I don't think he wants to be engaged mm -hmm. in the currency war at well, all. Well, it's so hard not to. I mean, it's like the Well, now there's calls for what, Treasury to coordinate with the Fed and actually do intervention in the dollar market? Yeah. Actual intervention. I mean, to get, to break the dollar down is such a critical thing for, uh, for guys like me who have to make calls on that and move. Like my entire net wealth is still in what I call quad four stuff, which is treasuries, gold, utilities, yep. REITs. So the day that I see a believable and dovish enough Narrative. 50 basis yeah. points plus QE, i.e. dollar goes down. Mm -hmm. Now we get oil 65 at 85. We get gold going to 1600 right. instead of where it's been. And that's the real thing that I think, I mean, most of my clients, they're like, when does the dollar go down? And EM see, could go up for the first time. Some of these great ideas about how cheap it is. Yeah, it's cheap for a reason, because the dollar remains strong and global right. growth remains weak. Of course. And I think that if he was truly, truly going to try and play that game, you're talking about 50 basis points increments and $100 billion a month of QE now. That's what I was saying in meetings, and people look at me like I'm bananas. If you want to fight the currency war. To get the, to, to win it. Yeah. Like, yeah, to, like if you want to actually get your currency to go down. Yep. I mean, you could argue that Draghi was one of the most successful uh, participants in current, currency war history. His currency weakened. I mean, he, he went out with a dovish tilt. He sets it up for Lagarde, and now it's like, eh, I don't know what's going to happen there. But I he, never normalized. Sorry, I got to go now. But people believed him. Rome calls. The market absolutely believed Draghi. And when he, when he made the incremental push, it was real. Like adding, going back to where he went, you know, it, it's a real move. A year ago, they were talking about tapering in, in oh, Europe. Oh, no. So, I mean, it's not like he... And two years ago, I was in Brussels making a prediction that he would never be able to normalize interest rates. And they were like, there's the airport, Chicky. Bye-bye. <laughs> and I'm Chicky. like, you're going into recession before ever raising interest rates out of negative territory. This is ridiculous. And I'm like, whatever. <laughs> Trust me. Call me. We'll do lunch in two years, okay? Okay, when he's getting paid for 25000 25, bucks a lunch, which won't be Deutsche Bank anymore because they don't have a research team, but the um, oh. it'd be probably be uh, if Goldman does that or something. You should go there and say, hey, Chicky. <laughs> Chicky. <laughs> These guys, they he holds himself in pretty high regard. You think? Uh, I mean, uh, this, this, is, this is a central planner. Is it yeah, and he had over 50% of, of <laughs> EU GDP completely against him. <laughs> we have a lot of questions on, like, your take on how hyper-focused Powell is on the credit market. I agree with you 100%. I, this, apparently, this is uh, surprising some people that, 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 that you believe that with such uh, conviction. Well, you, the, we have 
almost $250 trillion of debt in the world. It's kind of linked. <laughs> Um, if, if credit volatility is unleashed, then you are going to have the great discovery mission. It's going to be, it's going to be like, instead of where's Waldo, where's systemic risk? Yeah. Because that's what you're going to find out if credit volatility increases. Yeah, that's period the, end. It's the, it's the genie that is still somewhat in the bottle, but creeping out. And on a practical level, you have to have CFOs focused on buybacks. Yeah. You have to. And they, they can't do two things at once. They can't be focused on fixing their balance sheet mm -hmm. and on doing share buybacks at the same time. Yep. They're inherently conflicted. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Powell understands the linkages. This is the man who in 2012 said, we are blowing a fixed, a duration bubble across the entire fixed income spectrum, mm -hmm. credit spectrum. I mean, yep. I'm quoting and, him. And people don't, like, I mean, I was, uh, last week it was a three day whirlwind. I did like 21 meetings in three days. So you go into New York and I'm like, just bang, 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 eight meetings in a day sometimes. And one day in particular, I had uh, two of the bigger credit hedge funds that are actually hedge funds, like they actually short stuff. Mm -hmm. Not credit long only, we call ourselves a hedge funds, we get the fees. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the unanimous depiction of credit and it's, you know, the, the variance across credit. You have the index level of credit and where high yield spreads are trading, yeah. but you got this barbell of C's and anything under B, you know, double B minus, and then high grade trading like it's a sovereign piece of debt. So that is like, that's also symptomatic of what, where we are in the cycle. Oh, yeah. Like credit spreads tightened you've seen, a year ago. You've seen credit spreads come after. in materially. You've seen credit spreads really come down. What we had like $13 billion of junk issuance last week and at some of the tightest yields of the entire cycle. Yeah. But what has not come in? Triple C's refused. No, exactly. So what Triple C's sitting out there because anybody who's actually got money betting on this, I mean, December's not so far back. No, that's right. That people can't remember that this, this junk was trading by appointment only and that there was no liquidity at all and that there's this new ETF structure that's wrapped around fixed income that didn't exist in 07 and that on top of that, you've got Dodd-Frank, Basel III, and, and bond de dealer inventories down 90 plus percent. Mm -hmm. You cannot stress test this puppy. Mm -hmm. And Jay Powell knows it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I try to link that to poor people out there that are just still focused on CNBC stocks. It's always about stocks. It's like- But if stocks you are about credit. Stocks are a mirror reflection of buybacks. Exactly. So what How I try to- How many charts have you seen out there that's like everybody else has been selling except for corporate America? Yeah, if you take a broad-based you know, basket of stocks, Russell 2000, there's a lot of stocks in there. You can see the Russell's still down 10% from where the cycle peaked at this time yeah. last year, 10%. You'd have to be up almost 12 to get back to break even. And if you look at a basket of credit, you'll see the barbell. So it's, it's just that you go down further down the more obvious path of growth is slowing, right. and there's a direct relation to earnings. A chart that we should show, guys, if you could show slide 69, I think it is, in the deck. Um, if it's not, it's going to be the one before, you know, one before that there. So again, what you just said is, is a direct reflection. Corporate credit reflects the TTM trailing 12 month cash flows. Like yeah. that's the all, that's on a log chart. That's the all time high in S&P 500 earnings in the path to get there through the lens of tax reform. So you know, that line is coming down. Earnings are coming down and at what rate? Well, when people say that there's a lot of credit, no shit there's a lot of credit. It's built on those cash flows. Of course it is. But it's also built on the assumption those, all those cash flows are safe. And by the way, the cash flow has been pay, has been financing the buybacks. I've got more whack jobs it on my Twitter feed who are like, it's all debt financed. And I'm like, no, it's not. No, it's not. The vast preponderance is financed by cash flows, right. period, end. You go, go, just go look at, people who are trolling you on this, just go look at, look at stock buybacks in, in late 08 and early 09. Yeah. Eh, that doesn't happen. They happen when they have the cash flow. Exactly. Same thing with CapEx. CapEx is now negative year over year because the cash flows are going negative exactly. year over year. So I, and I, everybody discounts, now, now nobody on Wall Street now follows facts set. John Butters is a great analyst, but, but now that he's had, you know, now that we know we've got three consecutive quarters of negative EPS, and it's looking more like four, Moody's just took down this afternoon the entire chemical sector. And this is just consensus. Yes. Mm. But we, but, but it, you know, if you actually agree with facts set when earnings are going up, which I do, and <laughs> now that they're going down, I still agree with their analysis. I mean, we're talking about a year of negative 
earnings, yeah. which is going to start to sort of look like what's in the GDP report, the way they report profits, which Wall Street has also disregarded. Yeah, it's 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 people are complimenting you, saying happy birthday. By the way, this is oh, thank you. Fan, fantastic color with real data. I love you, Danielle. There's like a lot of love out there for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> TMI. Uh, how significant is the impact of the LIBOR euro dollar on Fed policy? You have it. Like, it's kind of like a. Well, look. If you have an opinion, give it. Th this is this is what I'm going to say about, about that. Uh, the transition to SOFR, S O F R, uh, is not going as planned. Okay. And we need a new reference rate, but the entire market is in in a mutinous state, refusing to shift from LIBOR to SOFR. Mm -hmm. It's just not happening, and mm -hmm. that's problematic because so much is priced off of it. Mm -hmm. And and a real interesting point that you also made in this conversation is that the whole world's reference rate on what is not NERP is, is our risk-free rate. Risk rate. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's so you have to have a positive reference rate or every Nobel Prize winning economist, every valuation model, every discount model, everything falls apart. To say nothing of every life insurance company, the pensions. Yeah, no, exactly. Back to Shelton, uh, now that we spoke about it. Um, did you read her op-ed yesterday, Danielle? Uh, did you have an opinion in her op-ed in the Wall Street Journal? This was the monetary policy should be coordinated with the White House. I, I assume. I mean, it, yeah, no. to, to get in um, there, you have to have an opinion, right? Yes, but um, sometimes I can't get past a headline. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't do a lot of. If there are no numbers, I don't. I can't go down far. It's, into it's the not reading. so much that. I mean, I, I can read a good op-ed, but again, I know Judy personally. And you already know what she, she thinks. I, I, yeah. Yes, and. What I think what she's trying to communicate and convey is that there needs to be a disciplinary body that imposes yeah. monetary discipline at, but for God's sake, it can't be the White House. <laughs> oh boy, is this going to change in the next year. Uh, and really, I mean, if the White and I'm not saying anything about Trump, by the way. No. Period. And I'm saying no White House should have influence over the Federal Reserve mm -hmm. at all, or Congress for that matter. But the Fed needs to pull its the Fed needs to reform itself. Yeah, this is Constitution so Day, I believe, in the USA. Can you guys uh, double check that? I was that? born on Constitution Day. Yes, oh, I was. so you know, and I'm a Canadian, and I know too. See, I got some respect for this country. That's I came to. impressive. Yeah, but, very nice. But a lot of us came to this country because it is American free market capitalism. I came in the in the of 1990s. Uh, Constitution Day is totally cool. So is your birthday. I mean, like, like what we're talking about really with these Judy Shelton things, uh, and or some, you know. Much scarier version, which is if you look at the Warren kind of plans for MMT or Bernie Warren. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the debt ceiling has given the government unfettered spending capacity through June 2021. <laughs> that means whoever gets elected gets to spend whatever they want on whatever they want, including universal basic income. Yeah, U oh, UBI. I'm just, but but there's, there's no... The media didn't even touch this. There's no limit on spending, debt spending, until June of 2021. <laughs> what? The, what? Inauguration days in January, people. Mm -hmm. When it becomes an acronym, it's officially in motion, I think. I think that's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. uh, there was actually a couple acronyms in China overnight. The OMO, Open Market, Opera uh, open market Operations, I believe, uh, you know, where they just, they actually didn't do enough. And boy, were the Chinese pissed off about oh, that. Oh, man. It's but like, that, where's my candy? But that's not what the narrative Shanghai got is shellacked. People don't literally wake up in liquidity space. They wake up to this day. No, but now everybody's talking about FRA, OIS, and they're watching GC rates. And I mean, my Twitter feed has all of a sudden got a friggin' PhD. Yeah, it's pretty good, huh? Because they're all talking, every, everything's TLT. I mean, they're all talking about all of, yeah. and all the acronyms, which gives me the frights because it reminds me of 08 and 09. Gives you the frights. It does. Because you don't get the acronyms, guys, unless you get the slowdown. Isn't no. there a wonderful relationship between that? Think Growth about slowing. the laundry list of acronyms that flowed out of the New York Fed, all of those liquidity facilities that were created in the yeah. dark days of the crisis. Anti, we don't want acronyms. Acronyms are bad. Yeah, uh, MLF, medium lending facility. So yeah. the Chinese didn't roll over on that, uh, didn't reissue. But so China's, China's got a big, I, I, I was in Australia for almost two weeks recently. China's got some problems. Who you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. China's really got some problems. You can't, you can see it reflected in economies that have an over-reliance on China, which is how I left Australia, being very worried about that economy that's been expanding for 28 years that yeah. Jay Powell likes to reference. Yeah, you were talking about numbers of cranes, too. 
over 700 cranes throughout Australia, 222 in Melbourne. I mean, it's astounding to see over 300 in Sydney. And, you know, they recently had some guy on a balcony, you know, toss out a cigarette and the entire side of the building went up in flames. <laughs> and as it turns out, a lot of the Chinese developers that came in used flammable uh, casting on the outside of these massive buildings that everybody's like, for some reason, I don't want to move into that building. Because <laughs> when you're walking down the street in Melbourne, you see oh, yeah. such and such architect, and then in Chinese, oh. you see such and such developer. But they've, they've all been thrown up so quickly with money yeah. trying to escape China but they've been not very well constructed. Uh, so uh, Australia's got some problems. I, I thought, I mean, I don't mean to laugh at, at, at people like that. I'm sure and they're lovely, gonna, they're the nicest but, people. But, they're, like, they're like people from my state of Texas, but, but they sound nicer. Yeah, they, don't, they wouldn't know otherwise, but I thought what you were gonna say was the cigarette dropped and the, and the whole crowd of people living on the streets you know, had a fight over the cigarette. I mean, that's what comes after the cranes. Go to San Francisco. I mean, it's very oh. clear. I mean, now it's a bathroom. Down, it's actually, it's either you go to Starbucks uh, or you go all over the place outside and, it, and they probably smell the same way. Visiting Los Angeles, Austin, Texas. I mean, any of these cities that are Austin, refuges. Uh, yeah, Austin's kind of getting a little snarly. And, and I, I mean, Austin. Yeah. We need to keep Austin clean. Austin can be weird, but can we keep it clean for God's sake? Yeah, we got, we got to wrap it up a little bit here, but I mean, Austin, the number one thing that came out of Austin's Tito's, Tito's Vodka. I think that's a great American story right I'm there. kind of a gray goose gal, I, but okay. If we go, like, I mean, maybe we should make Tito the head of the Fed or the president. Be exciting, wouldn't it? Imagine that, whoever founded Tito's. I think they could do, I think they could do well, mm -hmm. especially if they have MMT and they could fund unlimited I, Tito's. There to I get was at the bar in Australia staring at a bottle of Tito's. It's yeah. everywhere. Yeah, I think they're thinking they're wrongly about forgiving student loans. Just give people unlimited Tito's, a national, <laughs> a national, <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, Wait I'm, a minute, uh, <laughs> let's, let's make America drunk again. What? Yeah, exactly. No, no, no. I'm getting chirped uh, because of the shoes, by the way, and you called me, what did you call me, very what? Oh, they're very CT. Very CT. The Canadian has gone very CT because they told me I had to change my outfits. Um, I, thought they were, I thought they were tweeting about my shoes. Yeah, uh, actually they called you, <laughs> I can, actually I can't even no, say No, no, don't, don't repeat it. I'm not going to say Don't go it, there. But, but um, what you're really getting, and, and we have to wrap it up here, but you're getting a lot of compliments, so thanks you for your, I think every time we have a conversation it just gets better, and we're building on top of a lot of important things, and, and but I do. The, but the narrative hasn't changed. No. Wait, how no. did we end this last time? As long as credit volatility remains contained, everything's going to be fine. Yeah. It's the same story today. And do you think that, and I guess maybe last, last question on this, do you think that this is about to happen uh, faster, all this risk, or not? Uh, I think that the momentum build in the labor market negative news suggests that you've got recessionary forces that are building at the same time as you've got the potential for a liquidity event. Yep. And if those two meet, it's, it's game over. Mm -hmm. Because that's what, that's what happens when truly markets, if markets become overly dependent on constant liquidity infusions and, and growing liquidity infusions, if that collides with, with negative data, and again, 17 <sighs> straight months of revisions, I can't repeat it enough, it, it is game over. I'm with you on that. And if you're a permable and you don't like that, just be happy for Danielle on her birthday. She looks great, and I guess if you like my shoes, that's good too, but the rest is still gonna happen. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for spending some time with me, I appreciate it. My pleasure, thank All right, you. And thanks for joining, we appreciate it. We'll see you next time.